Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is Dennis and today I am with Brad. How are you doing, Brad? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, since this is the first time with the, with the podcast, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Brad. I was a... Uh... I'm a whiskey one medic, spent a few years in special operations medicine, I'm an instructor now over the schoolhouse, done a few deployments to various places around the world, and I'm here to talk about medicine. Awesome. So you have a story that's kind of tied with your reputation. So would you mind uh, just starting off with this story? Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially... It all began on a night raid in Afghanistan. Pretty quiet night, normal. Come into our target compound. It was a HPI target. Pretty quiet. Get into the village a little bit and find ourselves in a barricaded shooter situation. It's kind of small arms fire, grenades in and out. Nothing unusual for the area. And uh, it all comes to a lull. We're hearing on infill to this location that there's a bunch of Kares systems in the area. There's people going in and out of them. Uh, and at this point, they said that there was one that needed some investigation. So part of my unit went uh, to investigate this particular Kares system. They took my junior medic, the platoon medic for the strike force, uh, about 700 meters from the target compound to go investigate. To uh, do some SSC on some buildings that had been cleared, realized that the engagement with that barricaded shooter was starting to pick up again. So I moved myself back over to the point of friction there. Uh, came up. We were kind of investigating ways to get into this compound uh, other than the way that the barricade shooter was engaging us from. The squad leader that was leading that situation was prepping to throw some explosives into the barricade shooter's breach, and I was just in his footsteps probably, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds beforehand, and just an explosion occurred. Everything, everybody pretty much got rocked at that point. The first arm that was between me and the squad leader that was uh, doing the engagement with the explosives immediately came to me and was like, Doc, I'm hit. I'm hitting the leg. So I did a quick assessment, looked over his leg the best I could. Didn't see any real bleeding. I sent him out outside the compound to be assessed by an ARFR. As this was happening, uh, Apparently, one of the other squad leaders that was inside the compound had ran past myself and first sergeant outside the compound to be assessed by an ARFR as well. After assessing the first sergeant, myself, uh, local national platoon sergeant, and another squad leader and I pushed into the compound pretty close to the breach within a couple meters and found our patient, we call him patient two, call the first arm patient one uh, and the dude that ran through us and didn't even realize he was a casualty we'll call him patient four just for clarification purposes um, we found our patient too and he he was pretty pretty messed up he had obvious wounds to his right side at that point is what I could assess and it was very large wounds around the pelvic region so between the three of us, we got him out of the courtyard of that target compound, back behind a wall, into a smaller room where it was flat, and I was able to start working. Turn on my light and realized that his right arm, his right leg, and his entire pelvis was pretty much ex exposed. It was like kind of decloving. There was bone fragments, soft tissue damage, obvious bleeding everywhere. Um, and also a hole in his right side of his chest, about the size of a quarter. 
this time just kind of started my assessment and went into stopping the bleeding the best I could. So through tourniquets on the right arm, right leg, junctional tourniquet around the pelvis and, uh, had my EOD tech at the time, um, put pressure over the pelvis. So while this was happening, I was initiating a IV site on his left side, 16 gauge IV, pushed some TXA. It was one gram. Um, as also started a unit of blood on this patient. As that blood was going in, uh, my junior medic had arrived from that location investigating the caress system, showed up and was like, how can I help? Immediately told him to get out some needle decompression needles and a unit of blood and see if you can do a sternal IO. Sternal IO failed. <clears throat> Did needle decompressions in all four sites. Uh, and the patient that kind of drove us into that treatment by saying, I'm suffocating. Knowing what I knew now, it may not have only been his chest involvement. He could have been, it could have been from the blood loss. Um, so began that second year in the blood put the patient on the litter that eventually showed up with the HBMK. Um, at that point I had actually pulled out my chest tube and was going to start down that route. Ended up losing my chest, chest tube on the ground somewhere. Somebody was picking up the things that were around and, uh, it vanished. Luckily, uh, got the patient on the litter, moved him to an HLZ. It was about 150, 200 meters away and walked right into a near ambush from the wood line there. As you can imagine, exposed HLZ, not really a lot of cover, taking small arms fire from the wood line, frag grenades are being thrown. The element that was clearing the HLZ was engaged pretty heavily with the dudes inside the wood line. And uh, we were just doing our treatments on our casualties at this point. We had the first sergeant that had been hitting the knee and the foot. Sergeant Nabel, who was a junior medic, uh, did an assessment on him and also gave him some ketamine. And as he was doing that, I was assessing patient two for whatever else I could do for him. At that point, I had gotten a third unit of blood and began that process of hooking it up and heard over the radio that there was another casualty. Handed off patient two to Abel and said, and just keep him at a radial pulse. I'm going to see what's going on with the other casualty. So I started moving towards the wood line. And the third casualty, we'll call this guy the third casualty. He was a dog handler. It was bear crawling out of the wood line with blood squirting from the left side of his neck. Um, and as he came up, I told him, hey, put your finger in that. He was like, I'm trying. And obviously, he just wasn't able to manage that on his own. So I stuck my finger in the hole in his neck, stopped the bleeding temporarily, and kind of did a once-over, cut his kid off, assessed the rest of him, make sure all the blood that was all over him wasn't from somewhere else. Uh, at that point, I realized that he wasn't really talking. He wasn't breathing. His airway wasn't working. So pulled out some combat gauze and uh, stuff and replaced my finger with the combat gauze and had a local hold pressure on that. And I pulled out my crack kit. Um, an ARFR came over to assist me with that, pulled out his red lens, realized real quick that that was a bad idea. Uh, incoming fire started picking up a little bit. So cut the light out, did the crack after I told my patient like, Hey, I'm going to crack you. You're not breathing. Hold still. He kind of looked at me wide-eyed and was like, all right. That's kind of what I got from this non-verbal agreement. This is about to happen. Um, so ended up doing a surgical airway. Immediately got a large gasp. Um, put my ammo on just to ensure that everything was in place and started treating him for pain and anxiety, ketamine, versed. Noticed his radial pulse was starting to get a little weaker than before so um, at this point we had infused three units of blood onto patient two and we were on our fat our, our last unit uh, the fourth one that we carried on target with us that night and it was kind of a decision point we got a patient that's rapidly declining every time he doesn't have blood being pushed into him 
or a patient that has a weak radial pulse at this point. I do have Hemcon essentially. Um, where does this unit go to? And between myself and Sergeant Noble, we made the determination. Let's go ahead and give it to patient two. Let's keep him alive a little bit longer if we can. So ended up giving that to um, patient two. He received the chest tube from over at that HLZ location. He received more pain and anxiety medication and uh, another needle decompression or two on his left side. The chest tube ended up going on the right. So at this point, we were out of blood while we were working on our last unit, and we were like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? So came to the agreement between him and myself, let's go ahead and initiate the Rolo uh, battle drill, if you will. So called over the radio, we need a Rolo. Turns out we already had a Rolo right next to us. It was one of the ARFRs that was assisting us with this casualty treatment. Ended up drawing the unit off of him, pretty much infusing with a Y-tubing that has a pressure infuser ball built into it just to maintain that radial pulse and mental status at that point. It wasn't anything like trying to get him back to normal intensive. It just wasn't going to happen with our resources. So pretty much just maintain that radial pulse and let's keep riding this thing out as long as we can. At this point, uh, the tactical decision was made that this HLZ is not a safe one. Let's move to our alternate. It's about 150 meters away beyond the wood line we were just ambushed in. And we ended up walking into another uh, near ambush, and it was buildings to our west, east, and north. They were, had bad guys in it shooting at us in the middle of a field again. Uh, wasn't a very good place to be. Um, at that point, I was carrying patient three. Bull was carrying patient two. We get to our PZ posture, if you will. And uh, I realized that my neck injury started bleeding again and my crack tube had come undone. The securing device had come undone. So I had to re-engage all that, give some more pain medication. And uh, bouncing between patient two and patient three, realizing that we're going to need another Rolo unit. So we got another donor over there and I've drawn that off, given it to our patient two, just continue maintaining that radial pulse. Um, and as time goes on, it was about 45 minutes an hour that we were there, ended up drawing, almost drawing a complete other unit of Rolo. So this would be our third that was being drawn. At that time, our Xville helicopters came in to pick us up. Jumped on this helicopter with uh, two litter patients and about 30 local national military, and then myself, Abel, and then two other ARFRs that were assisting in casualty treatment. Luckily, uh, my other junior medic and the flight medic had been on the helicopter that we got on. So I was able to do a handover with patient three, um, just essentially told him the drugs I'd given, the treatments had been provided. They ended up giving him a unit of blood that was cold stored on the helicopter. They gave him, I want to say, another gram of TXA antibiotics and just continued to manage his pain and anxiety throughout the flight. And it was just Ended up being about a 30-minute flight, and it was supposed to be 12. We were loaded down pretty heavy, so we couldn't make it over the over the mountain, so we had to go around. Um, so after I did the handover of patient three, moved back to patient two with Sergeant Abel, and we, we just continued what we were doing. We ended up infusing two more units of cold stored, and then that last uh, unit of Rolo blood eventually got drawn completely um, and administered that as well. We ended up continuing ketamine for pain medication, and uh, I actually pulled out another chest tube and was going to do it on his left side. By that time, we were like, like I had everything out, cleaned, ready to go. We landed. Um, throughout that flight, we did uh, the second gram of TXA that he needed and also um, multiple access points, IO and IV. So we landed at the roll two and did a patient handover with patients two and three and one, and uh, realized I had that fourth patient. I hadn't even thought about him the entire time we were on the ground. Luckily, he wasn't really injured. He had grazing wounds to his arm and his leg. I did a once-over of him, did an IV on him, and handed him off to the FST for further evaluation. Um, 
But after that, took a few minutes and uh, collected my thoughts for a few minutes, and then we immediately went into the walking blood bank situation. So the uh, role two there had established a walking blood bank upon arrival. They hadn't started drawing units yet, but when we showed up, we we drew anywhere between 30 and 50 units between the three or four of us because our PJ was there as well. Um, and just basically handing it over to the OR so they can infuse it while they were doing their treatments inside the, uh, the suite there. About, I'd say, 10 units in for myself, I decided to scrub up, go into the OR, try to assist with any anything I could help with, just looking where I could put my hands or my eyes, and uh, ended up trying to help with the right arm, looking for vascularity to your ligate or clamp off or whatever we were able to do, but it was pretty, it was pretty messed up. So it wasn't really salvageable at that point. So we ended up leaving that tourniquet on the right arm. At that point, I realized the, the blood cooler was starting to get a little bit low. I kind of ran out of my expertise as a risky one. Like I'm not a surgeon. They had the belly open. They were putting a rebo in. They were doing all the things that their job is. So it's like, you know what? I'm better suited out there drawing blood, making sure that they have it when they need it. So we went outside and drew a few more units of blood. Dust off came in to pick up our casualties. Really, it was just patient two that they were picking up at that point. Uh, the rest of them got picked up on the next flight. But we loaded up patient two with a vascular surgeon. He ended up administering quite a few units of blood en route to the roll three. Myself, both of my junior medics and my PJ from the team, we jumped on the other dust off and flew in tandem back to the roll three. Pretty much that was it. That was where we relinquished all of our treatments or that was our patient handover at that point. Like we were done putting our hands on. So they just pretty much took it from there. Yeah. Now outstanding. Um, you know, just of what we're expected to do on the battlefield. Obviously we, we train for scenarios similar to that, I guess, usually individually uh, one patient at a time. And obviously it went very well because they all survived. Is that correct? Yep. So I guess, what did it take other than you went to the schoolhouse, uh, you went to Sacramento every couple of years <clears throat> for your unit. What did it take to make um, one, the blood that readily available? So it's a whole bunch of things that it takes. It takes a lot of buy-in takes a lot of buy-in from your upper leadership all the way down to the lowest private that's on the line. Um, starting out with letting the command know that like, this is our, this is a battle drill that we want to be good at because when we need it, we do. Um, so it enables them to allow time for training for that coming down to like the company level, incorporating your commander, first sergeant or your platoon sergeant, or your team leader, whoever that is, Again, making them aware this is something that when it needs to happen, it does in order to save somebody's life. So they incorporate casualty training into every training event. Down to the platoon level, each squad has ARFRs, which are Advanced Ranger First Responders. Um, and they're trained uh, for two weeks in a course and then throughout training cycles. And pretty much everything that a medic does um, they have a knowledge of or are pretty skilled in it minus like drug administration, like dependent on the drug. Um, but everything else they're pretty spun up about. And we train this every training event with these guys in between training exercises. We're training them in the, in the battalion areas or wherever we may be. So they're training all the time with the medics. So essentially a first assist in everything that we do. Um, and that comes again, full circle, every training cycle, every mission that we, every full mission profile we do, every range that we go to, we have casualty involvement. So it's like trained into everybody's brain. If there's a casualty, this is how we react to it. We're going to continue our mission, but we have designated people that know their specific roles and responsibilities and coming down to medics just being good at what they do as far as how to train other people in medicine. That's a huge part of it because being a trainer or an instructor in these things, it, it takes a certain, you know, character. Um, so that as well. And then just repetition. Um, I think 
with everything I've said, you can you can imagine we get a lot of repetition in this specifically. Um, it's kind of a newer thing um, that's coming out to the rest of the DoD, um, but we've been we've been just pounding it in like day in day out. You ain't got nothing to do. Let's go train this. Um, so it it causes you to kind of have flawless execution in the moments that count. Um, and on that day, it was flawless execution. The, I mean, between six and like nine minutes, we were having a unit drawn off somebody, which is pretty quick um, on average. Um, I've seen quite a few people. It takes, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to draw a unit. And it's like if you train it and you hammer it home, you can get down to those good numbers, and that's where it really counts. So repetition is really what it takes. Yeah, that's something that that's always impressed me about the Rangers is not, um, you know, not stressing out about, uh, you know, should I add a Reboa catheter to my bag or, um, you know, uh, a DeWalt drill bit so I can, uh, you know, do my hemicraniotomies. It's, um, you know, how well are you at uh, sticking your IVs? Um, it's training the basics, I think, is you're going to save far more people than than any of the other things. Um, one thing I don't know is when you call out Rolo, like you mentioned over the radio, are you getting one unit or are you starting a cascade of events that are going to bring multiple units? So that's a pre-planned uh, situation. So before going out on mission, you do obviously your medical briefing during the concept of the operation. And um, at that point, we're establishing who the Rolos are on target, what their locations are. And like who's primary alternate, depending on what they've done or what their job is. So that's kind of how we go about that. So it's essentially like when that call is made, you hear it or your team leader, your squad leader hears it. Like, hey, I know it's been called like you are the guy that we're sending. Go to that location. So it's that first one. And then if it's called again, send the next one. So it's not like a all hands on deck thing. It's like as we need it. No, that that makes that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, now, since you guys have so much experience as far as drawing blood and, and administering blood, um, you know, the guys that you know we're training, if you're getting them in 15, 20 minutes, that's actually not horrible yeah. com- compared to uh, you know forty five minutes an hour that I've definitely seen. So, other than knowing how to place an IV, you know, what other things do, do guys need to do to get down to that, you know, seven minutes? So I think that, I mean, stressing the basics of it, like deciding which catheter you're using for infusion or taking out from your uh, donor, um, just having the reps. I mean, you have a lot of people that come and train it, but they're not training it daily. They're not training it weekly, you know. Um, so being able to select the right equipment, ensure your equipment's set before you're doing the procedure. Um, and that starts before you even leave to go out on your mission. You set up your kits in a way that is ergonomic and going to make you do things fast by laying it out appropriately. Um, whether that's prepping your Y tubing or it's making sure that those donor bags aren't like the ones that are at the bottom of the pile. So they all have all these kinks in them. Like it's just, just those little things that come into play that when you're trying to either take blood from a donor or infuse it into your patient, those little things like seconds make minutes, you know? So that, and then repetition is called, it's coming down to being prepared. Right. Um, do you guys do you routinely do the, uh, the PRN adapter on your, you use, you know, you mentioned you use 16 gauges. One is 16 gauge, the common, the common catheter you're using, or are you also using 18s? Do you normally add the PRN adapters to that to make the, the ruggedized IV, or do you just go straight? Yeah, so the, there, there's obviously a multitude of ways you can you can skim the cat, obviously. Um, so as far as drawing blood from your donor, from my experience, just the hard needle that comes on the donor bag straight to the vein has been the fastest way. There's no restriction. Um, It's already a 16 gauge if I'm not mistaken. So like just having that available straight to the vein, 
it provides the least amount of resistance going into the bag from what I can understand. And as far as that unit going into your patient, I'm a fan of just doing a straight line, a uh, 16 gig catheter, or if I can feel like I can hit a 14, I carry them both. Um, establishing that, putting my saline lock on there, administering the TXA, calcium, whatever the case may be up front, if my blood's not ready yet, and then disconnecting that thing and just doing a straight line. Um, again, least amount of resistance. I'm not beveling down to an 18-gauge needle that's going into the saline lock if I don't have the 16-gauge hard needles. So I'm looking at speed um, and how can I do this the fastest. Um, again, there's flaws to that, though. There's a lot of risk involved in that. If I get that pulled, I've now lost my access point. So that comes down to am I securing this appropriately, things like that. So it's shooter's preference, um, but I would encourage people doing this to use the biggest bore IV they can, however they're going to skin the cat. Whether it's putting a port in your donor and then plugging straight into that PRN adapter, make that a 16 gauge or a 14 if you can, preferably 14. Um, and then do your patient. Do the biggest catheter you can. You can see, like just from experience that you've had with students, like the difference in the flow rate between the 18 and the 16 and the 14. So logically, it's the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. Um, and absolutely, logically it does. I mean, there's a, a twofold increase in flow when you go from an 18 to a 16. Skill, though, on the other hand, 16s hurt, 14s hurt, and we're big wusses, so we train on the 18, and so on the X, that's what we do, because we're confident with yeah. that. So I would implore guys <clears throat> to start sucking it up and start actually training with the 16s. God forbid, train with the 14, um, just so you can get good at it. Your confidence will go up. Um just keep in mind when you're training, you're training on healthy people. So, you know, you may not be able to get that 14 on somebody who's hypotensive and they're bled out, but um, by at least training on it, you will have, you'll have the ability uh, to adapt. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's actually the thing. Like we train with the 16s, like 18s are great for just practicing your technique, things like that. It doesn't hurt. It's, simple but when you put your kit together and you're training off of that specific kit that you put together for this specific mission like you're putting a 16 there so let's train that and that's how we that's how in the past that i've seen people train it so yeah um you also mentioned for your admin set um <clears throat> that had a, a pressure infuser bulb in it yep. um have you found like do you, or at least in this situation, do you think that was the thing that saved the day? Uh, honestly, I can't say that definitively, but I know that it was utilized as an adjunct to target a radial pulse uh, in patient two. So continuous monitoring for a radial pulse is like the best we could do at the time. Um, and as that started fading, a couple pumps with that thing and it came back. So. I mean, it's a very simple way to save that precious resource and only give as much as you need. Um, but it's also, like, it's fast. It's real fast. So I encourage people to try it and see the difference between just a straight line, that pressure infuser pump, and then the pressure infuser bag. Um, another issue with the pressure infuser bag is, like, if you turn that thing upside down and you lay it down, yeah, it's great. But you're going to get a bunch of air in there if that thing goes upside down. With the pressure infuser pump, it requires you to have it in the right, I guess, configuration. configuration. Yeah, so it, you're not going to run into that issue. Yes, somebody has to hold on to the bag or you have to stick it to something or put it on something to hang it up. But it's not going to give you that comfort level of laying it down. So last thing I want my patient is that's dying is more air into their vein. It's just not appropriate, so. Yeah, that's frowned upon. Uh, <coughs> pump air directly into their into their vascular system. <laughs> um, what are, since you've been here, and obviously training your own guys, what are the real common mistakes that you see that 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 ends up screwing you up later on? 
So common mistakes right up front again is, I would say first and foremost, being prepared. So making sure you have the equipment in your aid bag for the mission. Um, I see it all the time where somebody doesn't have enough needle, hard needles, or um, they decide to only bring 18 gauge needles that are in those nice little NAR IV kits. They're great kits. Minus a couple things that are in there, but add a couple things to that. If you're taking stuff out, there's plenty of room for it. Um, maybe for the donor situation, taking that constricting band off, excuse me, when you're drawing blood, slows the flow rate down, leave the constricting band on. Or people putting that constricting band on way too tight, and then it's doing the same effect. Um, not inspecting their blood bags, having kinks in the blood bag, um, not having the citrate from that collection bag all the way down to the needle when it enters a vein or enters a PRN adapter. So you have a big gap of air there. I often see flow coming 